everyone. Welcome everyone and and to the to the fourth Wednesday event series. My name is Alfredo Garcia Vinuesa. I am a young ambassador of the European Marine Board. And today I I am going to be the moderator of this session. Um, our event today has um, one hour of duration and is divided in two parts. First, we are going to have a presentation from our speaker, Josep Lloret. And this presentation is going to be recorded and after will be shared in YouTube. Secondly, we are going to have an open discussion where you can ask Josep whatever you want about this pre his presentation and the topic. And this discussion uh, will not be recorded. Um, about the house, housekeeping roles, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, please make sure your name is clearly entered. Keep your microphone, your microphone muted unless you are speaking. Raise your hand if you will, if you would like to speak, and you can also use the chat function to make comments and ask questions. Um, next slide. And about the ECOP network, uh, this uh, network was established by European Marine Board Young Ambassador, Young Ambassador and Secretariat. It was created to early career ocean professional of European Marine Board member organizations. It's a great opportunity to network, to meet peers across Europe and to gain voice at European Marine Board level. And we have a dedicated Slack channel into the, into the network to keep in touch and, and discuss. Um, next slide. Well, uh, today we have a, we uh, have a, a fantastic speaker. Uh, he's uh, Josep Lloret. Um, he's associated, associated professor, um, director of the US Ocean and Human Health Share at the University of Girona. He has previously worked at the Institute of Marine Science in Barcelona, the CNRS in Perpignan, and the Tuning Institute in Hamburg, Germany. He, he has also conducted research at NOAA in the United States, States in the University of Iceland and in the University in, of Indonesia. His research is focused uh, on the topic ocean and human health and compares two different lines, relationships between marine ecosystem and the health and well-being of people and conservation of marine ecosystem and resources. So uh, thanks to, to be here uh, today with, with us, Josep. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alfredo and Paula, for inviting me um, in this presentation. OK, so I would like to speak about our recent work we did in the Mediterranean regarding the uh, ecological impacts of large scale offshore wind farms. Sorry, Taking... Joseph, we don't see your slides. I don't know if you press share screen again. Oh, I think I might have disturbed it by sharing mine. Uh, OK, sorry. Can you see now? No. No. Wait a moment, because it's... No. That, that, that's the desktop but, screen, but it is sharing. Yeah. And now it's okay? Yes. Okay, so it was off. Okay, so we take um, as a case study one of the first uh, offshore wind farms that are being uh, projected in the northwestern Mediterranean. You know that this is a, a big issue in Europe, but also in the Mediterranean and in Spain, because we don't have yet uh, a lot of these wind farms, particularly in the Mediterranean. So we want to provide uh, with this uh, paper a different view, view of what is being done uh, uh, at present with um, current works, okay? First of all, I would like to, to explain briefly the context. You know that in 2050, Europe must be um, become, must become uh, climatically uh, neutral. So we have the, uh, to enforce the rule that uh, we need to, to increase the, the percentage of the, 
the marine renewable energy in our uh, countries. This means to multiply by 15, the marine space uh, allocated to wind energy in around Europe. You know that in the North Sea, the North Atlantic and the Baltic Sea, at, at present, they account for more than 85% of all offshore wind capacity in European waters. So still um, very few in the Southern European seas, like the, for example, the Mediterranean. So we must reach this, uh, this goal of uh, offshore wind farms in at sea, but also the European Union says that these spaces, the spaces where the offshore uh, wind farms have to be uh, installed, they need to be compatible with the biodiversity protection, preservation of ecosystem services and other users. And for that, we have the U European Union Biodiversity Strategy for 2030 that um, remember that it says that we need to protect 30% of marine waters and, and terrestrial land, of which 10% must be strictly protected. So. What you will see in our uh, presentation is that this, um, both ideas may clash in the future because we need to protect the waters, but in the other hand, we need to uh, put many, many infrastructure in the waters to, um, to accomplish with the goal of the, of the renewable energy. So uh, we have different um, marine policy, okay? Uh, the marine strategy framework, the maritime splash and planning from the European Union. Then we have the, from the biodiversity side, we have the habitats directive and the birth directive and the biodiversity strategy 2030. All this in Spain uh, translate into a, a, a law, which is uh, related to the good environmental status, okay? It's a law of the marine environment. And probably you, you will have the same in your uh, countries because it's simply the translation of the European uh, rule. And what it says the European rule is that the, uh, in maritime spatial planning, you should apply an ecosystem-based approach, okay? This is very important, the ecosystem-based approach. You have the principles of the ecosystem approach in the Mal Malawi principles, okay? I will not read them, you, you know, probably know them. And in Spain, the law of the sea, which considers this uh, ecosystem management approach and the good environmental status, it says that adaptive management of human activities must be applied taking into account the precautionary principle and the ecosystem approach and taking into account the scientific knowledge. And this idea of the principle uh, precautionary principle sometimes, sometimes is being lost in the, in, the, in the space eh, when we go to the management. In Spain, uh, in fact, we don't have yet approved the uh, areas where the offshore wind farms can be um, deployed. So what we have is an old uh, strategic environmental assessment, uh, old um, plan dated in 2009 and now, there is another one in 2020, but it's not yet approved. It, it is still um, not, not yet approved, okay? Uh, remember that uh, a part of the policy, you have the sustainable development and corporate sustainability of the energy companies that they need to, uh, to follow, okay? This is something related to economy, but it's, uh, the corporate sustainability is, is also a very big issue now. So now we go, in our situation, in our case study. In our case study is Northwestern Mediterranean Sea. We have four offshore wind farms that are being projected. Remember before the, um, the area where they can be located is established. So the energy companies, they started to, uh, to um, apply for these projects. We have four, uh, uh, four different uh, projects. We don't know yet which will win because we don't know, we still have not, we don't know yet the area, okay? Um, the area where the uh, offshore wind farms will be placed is this um, red area here, which I, uh, so depending on the, on, the, on the wind farm, it will be further north or south, this is just for illustration purposes. From the beginning, when the energy companies, they, um, applied into the Spanish Ministry for the Space and the project. So uh, there was a strong social opposition. 
Okay, there is a, a, a civil society platform that has amassed the support of the governing board of two large marine uh, protected areas in Catalonia. This is Cap de Greus and Metas. This is the two largest. More than 20 uh, city councils in the area, the biggest local environmental NGOs, and more than 30,000 individual supports. So the social, local social opposition and the regional opposition is uh, very strong. Uh, against these mega offshore wind farms. There is also a, a huge uh, political debate how these mega offshore wind farms can be deployed in a responsible way without affecting the marine biodiversity. And, uh, and so we have been also invited, for example, in the, the Catalan uh, parliament to uh, give our thoughts, to give our uh, results. Okay, so there is also a strong political debate. We uh, wrote a manifesto, a scientific manifesto that were written by mm, nine science, which were experts in marine biology, oceanography, energy, biogenetics, and geography from different institutions in Spain, among my institution, and I was there. And this is a scientific manifesto uh, that was uh, supported by more than uh, 100 science of, um, for, of more than 20 research centers in Spain, okay? In where we said, okay, if you don't have still the knowledge, apply the precautionary approach and start conducting independent studies, not only the ones that will present the energy companies that of course they will do that, uh, these studies, but other studies must be done independently of the energy companies, okay? We presented this manifesto to the Catalan government, to the Spanish, government and to the European Commission. And in fact, the Commissioner of Environment, uh, Oceans and Fisheries, Mr. Uh, Sinkevicius, acknowledged the, that the area where the offshore wind farms I show you is full of um, nature uh, 2000 areas. And uh, so appropriate assessments must be done before the Spanish government uh, accept or not these uh, projects, okay? So our study, our, uh, we did our, st our uh, study that was uh, published in Science of Total Environment. And we are a group of uh, a multidisciplinary team made of marine biologists, physical uh, oceanographers, geographers, bioeconomists, uh, experts in corporate responsibility and energy from different institutions uh, uh, in, in uh, Catalonia area. So the first we look is the evaluation of the ecological characteristic of the area because we, uh, um, we don't yet have yet the farms to study the true ecological impact. So first of all, we based our knowledge and the previous projects, all of the people participating in this study, they have a great knowledge in the ecological uh, characteristics of the area. And the first thing I want to show you is that um, the area where the offshore wind farms will be placed, this is here in red color, is surrounded of um, different marine protected areas of different categories. In total, there are 10, okay? Of which one, two, three, four, six, and seven, and eight are Natura two, uh, 2000 sites. So this is marine protected areas, uh, cetacean corridor, etc. And then there is nine and 10, it's two closed fishing areas that were built for the recovery of fish stall, uh, stocks. You see that at least one of the offshore wind farm uh, will be placed just on this uh, closed uh, fishing area. The area is also uh, being promoted as a, a biosphere uh, reserve of the uh, UNESCO. And what we see in this area is that uh, um, it's one of the highest uh, biodiversity areas in the Mediterranean. It comprises more than 3,200 species, so it's about one third, one half of the known species in the Mediterranean, and 70% of the marine habitats describe it in Natura 2000. So it's an area of very high uh, diversity of species and habitats, many of which are fragile, as you will see. Uh, the area contains highly diverse and fragile benthic fauna. I will not put the numbers because we are now conducting deeper studies on that, but you will uh, you have uh, an extraordinary um, uh, diversity of marine fauna, many of which they 
uh, built habitat, functional habitat that provides refugia and food for many species, including the exploited ones, fish and invertebrates. A part of the area where the, the offshore wind farm will be installed, in the surrounding areas, in the surrounding marine protected areas, as I show you, you have different habitats which are protected by uh, European um, rules, like coral assemblage, which is similar to coral reefs, mild beds, and seagrass uh, meadows. It is an important area for the reproduction of small ecologic fish. And as, as an example, I show you two maps uh, in the Catalan coast. You see here the area of the Gulf of Roses uh, in the north. It's an uh, area, uh, and Cape de Creus, where the offshore wind farms will be placed. It's an area of uh, highly um, important for the uh, presence of uh, anchovy larvae and sardine eggs. So it's a very important area for the reproduction of small pelagic fish. It's also the area where the offshore wind plants will be placed. It's an important area for the migration of sensible and vulnerable species, some of which, some of which um, are threatened. Uh, marine mammals, there is a cetacean uh, corridor here, in the, as you can see in, the, in yellow. Then you have uh, also uh, some um, birds like the Balearic uh, seawater, uh, Puffinus maritonicus, which is critically endangered by the UCN. And then it is an area where you can find different sharks, like the blue shark, Prionace glauca, uh, which is also critically endangered in the Mediterranean. So it is an area of where you can find the presence of these uh, large vertebrates, uh, which are vulnerable or threatened. It's an area of highly, uh, it's an area of, um, of high production because of the particular conditions, currents and wind and strong winds, strong currents and river uh, runoff coming from the north, from the Rhone River. You know that the Mediterranean is um, oligotrophic, but in this case, in this area is uh, considered quite um, productive. It's an area also with high fishing pressure, but still uh, with the trawlers, particularly with the trawlers. But still, as you can see, there is an area of, uh, which is already preserved, eh? which is this closed area for fishing. Just to compare, because in some, in, in many cases, uh, we always say that, uh, okay, um, what is the difference, the main difference with the North Sea and the Mediterranean when, you go to the offshore wind farms and considering the ecological characteristics. The North Sea, you know that this is a shallow uh, area, a wide continental shelf, and mainly soft bottoms. On the contrast, Mediterranean Sea, overall, there is a narrow continental shelf, not everywhere, but uh, at least in the, in the area where I, uh, uh, we, is our case study, it is like that. You reach finally easily uh, 150 meters depth, often close to the shore. And then you see a high diversity of species and habitats. Uh, please keep in mind this difference, uh, just to know that uh, the, the, um, the behavior or the, um, the patron, the, the, um, the way how we want to install the offshore wind farms in the Mediterranean must be not the same as it is being done in the North Sea, where you have, of course, a lot of experience. So the second thing we uh, did is to analyze the technical characteristics of the offshore wind farms. Very, uh, brief, very brief, uh, probably you know these uh, characteristics. You have the fixed and the floating uh, wind turbines. In the North Sea, mostly you are using fixed turbines because they are more adapted to the uh, waters, shallow water depths up to 60 meters. And you have a lot of knowledge about these uh, impacts, ecological impacts, uh, socioeconomics, and so on. In the Mediterranean Sea, because of the um, bigger depths, uh, you, the energy companies, they are uh, proposing floating turbines, and you have no knowledge about uh, at all about these turbines. In fact, most of, of the offshore wind farms around the world, they are pilot studies. Only There is only one in, in Scotland, which is quite small, which is in operation, but the rest is uh, in, uh, in a study phase, okay? It's, uh, so we don't know yet the ecological impacts that will have this uh, offshore, offloading offshore wind farms in all uh, uh, marine ecosystems, that's for sure. One thing that you must uh, um, take into account is that the size of the floating wind, wind turbines, which is 
much bigger than the fixed wind, tur uh, wind turbines. Huh? Often they are compared to the Tour Eiffel. This is the kind of uh, uh, wind farms that are being projected in Cap de Creus uh, Golf of Roses eh, in our study area. And this is the kind of uh, wind farms, uh, turbines that are being proposed in other places in the Mediterranean like Cabo de Gata. Okay, so keep this, uh, this figure in mind. And then what is important is that despite the companies say that this is floating and they will have no impact on the marine ecosystems. Of course, this, uh, these floating structure, structures, they need to be anchored. And the anchoring of a turbine of 250 meters high, you can imagine that it's what is below the water. You have huge anchors and huge chains. Uh, and if you consider that each uh, platform at least has four chains and four anchors, and then you multiply by the number of turbines. For example, I have shown you before that most of the offshore wind farms being projected in Cap de Greus are 65, 65 turbines, more than 60 turbines. So you can imagine the space uh, they will need it and how much infrastructure, infrastructure there will be also underwater. It is, has been uh, computed that every uh, chain will move around a strip area of 70 meters. Then there is electricity transmission of floating wind farms. The floating wind farms, they need to transmit, of course, the energy to the to land. But because they are much bigger than the fixed turbines, they need larger substations, whether at sea or whether at land, OK? What are the potential ecological and socioeconomic impacts of the offshore wind farms, floating, floating wind farms in the Mediterranean. We combined our knowledge, ecolog ecological characteristics of the area, the technical characteristics of the floating wind farms, and then we revised with the bibliographic, uh, the bibliographic review of the impacts of the offshore wind farms in other areas, because we don't have yet this. So by combining this three source of information, we reached these um, impacts, which I will explain, explain very briefly. One is, the, of course, the impact of the anchors and change on, and change on the benthic habitats. Whether it's direct or whether it is indirect because of the sediment resuspension and the increase of the water turbidity of this big change. So this will produce an habitat alteration or destruction, impact on bentos, impact on fish spawning and recruitment crowds. And, and of course, this will have implications for the food web. This impact, the, the chains and, uh, and anchors, of course, they will impact in this case uh, to the closed fishing area that was uh, established by the government and the fishermen to recover the fish stocks. So this was something for the co-management. So these offshore wind farms, most of them will be placed on top of this closed area that has existed a long time ago. And so this is, this is the end of this co-management site. Another thing is the sound of, and vibrations of this very big structure. So this will produce an impact on sensible and threatening species, as I showed you before, like birds, mammals, and, and sometimes a fish, uh, considering that this area is a particular area for sensitive species. Then there is the impact of electromagnetic fields on animals. This area where you can also have uh, sea turtles and you have a lot of elasmorans, which are uh, sensitive to uh, electromagnetic fields. So um, we expect physiological and uh, behavioral changes and impact on migrations. Of course, these uh, structures, they uh, will can favor the expansion of, expansion of invasive and opportunistic species. Okay, consider that the Mediterranean is one of the seas around the world with more invasive and opportunistic species. So this new infrastructure will uh, still um, promote the expansion of these species. This is our, our uh, result in this case. Then you have potential changes in wind speeds and changes in ocean currents. Okay, changes in wind speeds, you have uh, a lot of knowledge in the North Sea that have uh, a lot of studies now have been reported uh, 
reduction of wind speeds downstream the offshore wind farms. Okay, and of course, this will be a problem in the Mediterranean because it's not uh, overall considered as a log, a log traffic, uh, 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 a very productive area. It's overall is uh, considered as a oligotrophic uh, sea uh, compared to the North Sea. So this will exer exacerbate the problems in the Mediterranean. And then changes in ocean currents. And for example, they will produce transport of uh, changes in the transport of larvae. There are other potential ecological impacts that we found very little info, inf information. For example, the collisions of vessels with these uh, wind farms, risk of fire, extreme weather, which will increase due to climate change, and then the ballast water, which is inside the floating wind turbines, not in the fixed ones, but in the floating wind turbines, which are those with uh, any uh, OH. The, then the, this will produce several uh, environmental effects, okay? Another issue is that, uh, and this combining ecological and socioeconomic impacts, is the industrialization of the sea and the coast. We don't have yet in, in our area, for example, which is an area where the coastal uh, is uh, quite, uh, devoted to fisheries or tourism or marine protected areas. Uh, we expect an industrialization of the sea and the coast with a new large, large and port uh, infrastructure electric superstations, as I show you, and then the uh, installation of the future uh, hydrogen plants. This will, of course, affect not only the uh, fragile coastal habitats like estuaries and wetlands, but also affect the tourism activities. And now entering into the socioeconomic impacts, we, I told you about the effects of the fisheries because of the, of the offshore wind flanks being implemented in the, on top of the uh, closed fishing area. But also consider that in this case, in, you are in one of the most important areas for tourism in the Mediterranean and in the world. If you link the notion of seascape and tourism, and this is something that we are working with geographers, okay? Uh, These uh, wind farms will affect also the seascape in the, every, of course, everywhere, but this will have a particular impact in this area because of the presence of tourist activities. Remember that the, the seascape relevance is already re, uh, acknowledged by the European Landscape Convention and it's linked to the life, uh, quality of lives of citizens, natural and cultural heritage. There are one study in the, in the, North, in the Catalan coast, which has been uh, analyzed the economic impacts of the offshore wind farms installations um, linked to the seascape loss. And it has been estimated around 2,000 million by touristic uh, season. And this study is only based on beach users. So it does not consider other users like scuba divers, sailors, uh, kayakers, etc. that are uh, numerous in the area. So you have a strong economic impact on tourism linked to the, just with the idea of the seascape value. Are there any potential benefits for marine biodiversity of these offshore wind farms? Yes, there are. But what we see is that what is happening in the North Sea, where you can, you, you probably, you know, all the nice works that have demonstrated the positive impacts on the biodiversity, they are not necessarily uh, happening in the Mediterranean coast. Because as I show you, the, in the North Sea, you have a lot of um, areas with mud and, um, and soft bottoms, where when you install such infrastructure, of course, you have an increase of biodiversity. But in our area, as I show you, we are a lot, we have plenty of biodiversity in Cap de Creus or Gulf of the Roses. So we think that it will have no uh, beneficial impact, but it will have a negative impact in this case. Um, is there any effect for fisheries? Yes, in the North Sea, it has been demonstrated that in the degraded uh, zones, in the degraded zones by trawlers, you have a positive effect. But in our area, as I show you, the offshore wind farms will be placed in an area which has been already close to fisheries for the recovery of fish stocks. So it's, we think that it will simply 
affect this area. So there will be here no positive effect for the fish production. Our case study will be not unique. Uh, I think you will have, you will find similar situations in the Northeast Atlantic, in the, sorry, in the Northeast United States, also in California, where you have uh, some places that are similar to Cap de Creus, Gulf of Roses and the Mediterranean than to the North Sea. Okay, this is, has, this is being studied by uh, NOAA. Also, you will find similar places like Australia, with these uh, similar places, or also in the Norwegian uh, continental shelf, where you have, for example, these deep water coral reefs. So uh, we think that our case study in the Mediterranean will be not unique, and it will happen in other weather areas around the world with uh, Balwell Bell, uh, biodiversity, seascape, and um, tourism, for example. Okay, our study was. Um, uh, maybe because, because of this, our study was um, was disseminated around the world. For example, we were in the New York Times, uh, and th they titled this as an intrusive energy solution. So just to put a little bit of uh, critical voice of the New York Times. So just to end, the final remarks. Remember the nature-based solutions. We need the offshore wind farms, but also we need to protect the marine biodiversity because it's the first uh, alley to mitigate the climate change impacts through the, re to, through the resilience of the marine ecosystems and the idea of the blue carbon these marine ecosystems uh, absorb. And this has been recognized, for example, in the last uh, EPCC uh, report. Okay, so the idea of the marine biodiversity as a nature-based solution. If we destroy the marine biodiversity in areas of high biodiversity, the positive effects of the offshore wind farms to mitigate climate change effects, they will be easily destroyed, easily uh, erased by the fact that we will, we will destroy the health of our oceans and the biodiversity. And the second thing, and we must think over, is the viability of the energy transition. Okay, we work together with a, a oceanographer, Antonio Turiel, which is expert in energy and, and materials. And uh, what we see is that all the deployment of the, this massive deployment of offshore wind farms, they will need critical materials like rare earths. These rare earths are produced far away, not only are uh, very small quantities, but they are also produced in a very unsustainable way. Far away of our views in Europe, far from Europe, in probably mostly in developing countries. And we will need to uh, multiply by many times the uh, um, extraction of these rare airs to, to build up this uh, offshore wind energy. And in fact, what the projections are that you will not have enough rare earth to produce all the offshore wind farms that are needed. So just to conclude, uh, as a key message, one shoe doesn't fit all. So what is happening in the North Sea does not need to apply in the Mediterranean on the, or the northeastern uh, coast of the United States or Australia. We should look for the particular ecological, biological, and socioeconomic characteristics of each European sea and each area to understand the potential ecological and socioeconomic impacts of the offshore wind farms. The floating uh, technology is incipient. We need further analysis of the potential ecological impacts. The precautionary principle must be applied now. It's not only a theoretical uh, concept, it's a must. and It's linked to the European rules. The offshore wind farms, as we have seen in our study, and this was our final conclusion, must be, must be excluded and placed far away from marine protected areas, Sensulato, European um, Natural 2000 uh, Network, and other figures of protection. The good environmental status uh, of the marine environment must be guaranteed. Uh, we must bet on the protection of marine biodiversity as a natural based solution to fight climate change. And of course, we need to reduce our consumption of energy and materials because even if we deploy this massive deployment of uh, wind farms, 
we will uh, the viability is not uh, will be compromised. So we have two projects now starting in the area. One is the biopays, which will look into further uh, the analysis of these impacts, and one is another other one is ECORES, which is the recovery of um, damaged habitats in the Mediterranean. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have other, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer you. Thank you, Giuseppe. Uh, that was uh, fantastic. Uh, um, 